it is very difficult for any country to protect their citizens from Chinese products. The real problem here is that you have a political system that does not punish manufacturers for bad products. And it's because it's the nature of the political system. The Communist Party does not allow independent prosecutors, doesn't allow a free press, doesn't allow people to complain about bad products. Let's take fish. There are 3.5 million fish farms in China. The fish are raised in contaminated ponds. They're fed all kinds of hormones. And the biggest market for that fish is the United States. 85% of the tilapia comes from China. Most of our shrimp comes from China. US FDA only has the ability to inspect 1% of the fish coming into the United States. 65% of the 1% they reject. They don't have the authority to confiscate the fish. So if the ship comes into Charleston and gets rejected, then it goes to Miami or New Orleans or some other port, and eventually the fish gets in. And because of such dangers, Americans are becoming more and more aware of the Made in China label. But that doesn't always guarantee one's safety or convenience. I personally do look at the labels of where things are made. But sometimes I go to buy things and it's impossible to find something that isn't made in China. But my wife's a good card-carrying liberal. She believes in all the worthy causes in the world and all that sort of thing. And she's an intelligent woman, I want to say, for the record. Little by little, I realized that China was getting to where it was and the United States was getting to where it was because there was all this currency manipulation. And it just seemed like the United States government was not doing a whole lot in the name of international trade to try to stop what was going on in China, which was able to lure a lot of jobs. Some months ago, she decided that to the best of her ability, she wasn't gonna buy anything made in China. So our microwave oven failed. We don't have a new microwave oven because she could not find one that was not made in China. When I went to look for a microwave, a freestanding microwave, there was nothing that wasn't made in China. I went to five different stores, from high-end hardware stores to low-end discount places nothing was available that wasn't made in China. And my experience from things made in China was that they weren't healthy, you never knew what was in them, they didn't work for very long, and they broke down if they worked in the beginning. So I then decided I just wasn't gonna buy anything that was made in China. So we just, you know, do not have a microwave anymore. Right around the same time, we had a, uh, under a counter electric unit for heating in one of the rooms. And the same thing happened. You couldn't get any electric baseboard that wasn't made in China. And I thought, well, my last one was made in America. I had it for 23 years, it worked great. Now I couldn't find it. And I just got completely discouraged that no American manufacturers were coming in to produce quality products over here. And that's the dilemma we now find ourselves in, as China has used its weapons of job destruction to so thoroughly capture our markets, we are left with few choices other than to buy from China. But the more we buy from China, the more risks our families face from dangerous Chinese products, and the more jobs we lose. And because this is true, we now must also confront this much bigger truth. We import a lot of stuff from China, but a lot of it we don't pay for. I mean, we've got no goods to ship in the opposite direction. So we just ship bundles of dollar bills. Between two and three trillion dollars is available to buy up pieces of America. In other words, we're living beyond our means. We have an, an artificially high standard of living. We're consuming more than we create. That's a very dangerous situation. Okay? And especially if your principal creditor is a nation like China. So just exactly how did we in America allow ourselves to be backed into such a dangerous Chinese corner? When you live in a democracy, it's always subjected to being hijacked. And our democracy has been hijacked by the multinational corporations. The corporate responsibility is to its shareholders, and it often has a legal fiduciary responsibility to its shareholders. The government has responsibility to the people and the national interest. Those are not necessarily the same. 
U.S. multinational corporations knew exactly what was going to happen. They didn't have any plans to increase exports to China after China joined the WTO. They had plans to move production to China. But they were, I'd say, dishonest or disingenuous because the whole rhetoric around China joining the WTO was about free trade and opening markets and engaging with China. For the first time, our companies will be able to sell and distribute products in China made by workers here in America. When, in fact, it was really self-interest and profit motive on the part of U.S. multinationals that drove that debate. And U.S.-China commissioner and businessman Dan Slane knows firsthand just how this offshoring shell game is working since China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001 and began flooding American markets with illegally subsidized exports. I had a plywood manufacturing facility in Bowling Green, Kentucky, selling plywood to furniture manufacturers in the United States. In 2002, all my competitors were moving to China. Uh, essentially, I had two choices. I shut the company down or I moved it to China. And I opened up three factories in China and delivered to the customer in the United States 50% cheaper than I could make it in Bowling Green. And Slane's newfound competitive edge was all due to China's illegal weapons of job destruction. Manipulating the currency was a huge help for me because it kept our prices down. I had no environmental issues. And the most important thing was that I could sell my product at cost. And every month, the Chinese government would send me a check for 17% of my exports. And that was my net margin and my profit. So was Slane wrong to offshore his factories to China? This interchange with U.S.-China commissioner and multinational corporation lobbyist William Reinch offers some perspective. It's not generally regarded as the job of a large American company to, uh, you know, substitute itself for the government. Uh, what but most of the companies want to do is to, they want to be consistent with government, with U.S. law and U.S. practice. If the government tells them that they would like them to do something, uh, they generally do it. So they don't have any responsible per se to the American people other than obeying the existing laws and regulations. Is that fair? Well, what responsibility would you like them to have to the American people other than trying to be good corporate citizens and to be profitable? Would you define a good corporate citizen as a company that moves its factories over to China and creates massive unemployment in the Midwest? Is that good corporate citizen? Well, I think that you'd have to ask, you'd have to look at, uh, you'd have to go case by case. And in Dan Slane's case? The difference between myself and General Electric is that I had no choice. I either moved to China or I shut the company down. I couldn't compete. Jeff Immel at General Electric does have a choice. He can sacrifice some profits, keep his technology, and in the long term, be much better off manufacturing in the United States. Congressman Tim Ryan understands this distinction between small domestic manufacturers and the big, well-heeled multinationals better than most. There's a huge divide here between the mom and pop a tool and die maker that has been in Youngstown, Ohio for a hundred years in the global corporation that's involved in the global financing of all of this stuff, the global manufacturing, and not really concerned with any one country. They're concerned with how they can best do business. And one of the biggest obstacles to passing tough legislation that would stop China's unfair trade practices is the lack of political clout of America's domestic manufacturers. And to go chasing down after all of the political rhetoric of dealing with this issue and that issue and running for Albany or running to Washington, D.C. and setting up meetings and stuff, um, it's too costly, it's too time consuming, and it has nothing to do with building drum and barrel handling equipment and helping this company to be successful. And that's the issue here. They don't have lobbyists down here. There's very few uh, organizations that really represent um, the small and mid-sized manufacturers. Uh, you know, I can think of one or two that really do a great job, but they don't have the the impact, the campaign contributions, the corporate influence that some of the big dogs have. 
And just who is one of the biggest dogs on the Capitol Hill lobbying block? Behind me is the headquarters of the National Association of Manufacturers, which unfortunately has become a major misnomer in recent years, because the name really should be the National Association of Manufacturing Things Someplace Else. If you go back and you look at the uh, National Association of Manufacturers meetings in which they were talking about endorsing or not endorsing uh, the Ryan Murphy China currency bill, uh, you will see that there was a huge split where the small and medium sized manufacturers endorsed the bill. But the 20% of the membership that gives 80% of the dues didn't want to have anything to do with the Ryan Murphy China currency bill. Brian O'Shaughnessy is the chairman of Revere Copper, a company founded by none other than Paul Revere and the oldest manufacturer in America. And O'Shaughnessy has been on the inside of the National Association of Manufacturers when it has opposed bills like those offered up by Tim Ryan to stop China's currency manipulation. I stood up before a group of 300 of the most powerful CEOs in this country, and I told them, as we consider NAM support of this bill, I think those of you who have facilities in China, I think you should recuse yourself from voting. You're conflicted. You have to choose between your company and your country. And you can't do that. Well, I was shot down in flames. By all intents and purposes, a lot of these companies are not American companies anymore. General Motors takes TARP money and opens up factories in China. Caterpillar Tractor shuts down plants in Peoria and opens up three factories in China. General Electric and Boeing are essentially trying to become Chinese companies. Look at Coca-Cola. American sounding company, isn't it? I mean, how American can you get other than Revere, Coca-Cola? The president of Coca-Cola is from South Africa. The chairman is from Turkey. Now, you want to ask them uh, what America's international trade policy should be? You shouldn't listen to them. While Coca-Cola's executive suite may look like the United Nations, it is purebred American CEOs from companies like Cisco, Ford, IBM, Honeywell, Motorola, Intel, and Apple that keep sending so many of our jobs to China. We design the iPad, great. We get the profits from the iPad, fine. We don't get the jobs. 